People like Anita and other people who've spoken today make me really proud that I'm a nurse because people like Anita and the other people who spoke make nursing a profession that people should aspire to be in and I thank you for that. I have a very privileged job. I am a national um, lead for end-of-life care at the Royal College of Nursing and I go all over the country and I meet fabulous people. I also hear horror stories which make me completely and utterly ashamed of some of my fellow members of the profession, some of whom shouldn't be allowed to be nurses, some of whom have somehow lost their way and can be helped to do the right thing again. For me, this is all about good leadership. It's about people like your chief executive, like your chairman, believing in what you said, supporting what you wanted to do, and then allowing you to do what you needed to do, to follow your heart, to make the best difference for patients that you care for. And I think that I've talked a lot today about what isn't happening. The people who make this happen are the grassroots people and the people at the top having a meeting of minds with the absolute focus being on the people for whom we are paid to care for and their families and not leave people with the horrific, horrific memories that some of the people who've spoken here so bravely today have shared with us. I was involved with the Liverpool Care Pathway um, work when all of that came into the press and then subsequently worked on um, the national <coughs> Um, the national report, one chance to get it right in response to all of the work around the Liverpool Care Pathway. And the worst thing about people dying badly is that that memory lives forever and ever and ever. People dying well lives forever and ever and ever, but in a nice way, that you celebrate somebody's life and their death and the privilege of being there. But the hurt that people feel and the anger and the passion that people feel when they're left with bad memories lives on forever and it makes you sick yourself. It embitters people and it destroys people. And we should never ever be responsible for that happening as nurses or as doctors or as carers or as porters, doesn't matter who we are. We have an absolute responsibility to do the right thing by the people we care for. And so I've only got three pictures. I don't want to see that ever. Now, I know that that old man might actually be really happy sitting on that bench because he might be where he wants to be, but he doesn't look very happy to me. And that's how people feel if they're left isolated, uninformed, lonely and scared on a ward, in a care home, in their own home, without the people that they want to be with them. And we mustn't forget that sometimes the people they want with them aren't their families, and that can be very difficult for um, professionals. You know, I have had some really interesting um, bedside conversations with mistresses and wives and children and all sorts of people, and it's difficult. But we do have to respect the individual's wishes. And I think the thing for me which is the most important thing, whatever we do, is to establish who that person was, not the person who might be there now, who were they? Your husband, Sheila. You know, a man of skill, of education, Nikki's father. These are people who had lives, who had loves, who may have had done awfully bad things. I met a marvellous woman of 90 who brought up her children, sent them to public school by prostitution during the day. She was proud of that, absolutely. She was marvellous. She owned eight houses, and all on, all on her back, as she said. So, so, um, so it's really important to find out who the person was and, um, and that they actually had a life that may not be something that even we would have approved of. So we need to find out who the person was. We need to find out who the person, what they liked, what made them laugh, what made them cry. We need to find out the fundamental essence of that person, and then we can do something towards making their end of life a good one. And that involves their families, it involves having a laugh, it involves doing stupid, mad things. And we mustn't let confidentiality 
or risk or difficulty or lack of time or lack of will prevent us from doing what the right thing is. And um, I know we said this morning it isn't all about being nice, but it is about being a decent human being. And, I, I, and, and for me, you shouldn't go into any sort of profession such as ours without being a fundamentally a decent human being that can look at their image in the mirror in the morning and be proud of who they are. Because if you can look at yourself and be worrying about what you should have done or shouldn't have done or might have done or might not have done, then you're not probably in the right job. This is what it should be like. This is what we should be allowing people to remember about having absolute laugh having a hug, hopping into bed with the person that you love because that's where you want to be for the last day. My granny switched on the electric blanket after my grandpa died and kept him warm till the morning so she could stay in bed with him just a little bit longer. And we should allow that to happen. It's terribly, terribly important. And I know it's a, as an old story, but the story about the elderly lady with her horse in the car park. There's a lovely picture on YouTube. I haven't got it here of that horse who she had actually brought into the world. She, she, she'd actually had him since the fall. And her hospital bed wheeled into the car park of the hospital and the horse actually there mouthing her face because he loved her and she died the next day and she'd seen the horse that she loved. So these sort of memories are fabulous and we must allow them to linger on in the, in the lives of the people who are left behind. David Oliver, I don't think he's still here, said something about why don't nurses stand up for, for things, what happens. I don't, those, we talked about the Francis report earlier today. The only people, nurses, who've been struck off as a result of the horrors at Mid Staffordshire are band six and below. Where are the leaders in that? Where are the people who should be held accountable for that? Because bad nurses aren't born something happens to make that happen. And with poor leadership and poor role models, then you are not shown the right way to do things. I remember the very first ward sister that I worked with as a student nurse, and she was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I have no idea what her first name was. <laughs> she was sister, and she was terrifying, but she was the most stupendous nurse and she sat me down, she said, have you ever seen anybody die? And I said, no, I haven't. I was 19. And she said, I'll sit with you. The lady in there is dying. Her family aren't able to be with her, and she needs somebody to be with her while she dies. She said, if you're frightened, I'll stay with you. If you're all right, then I'll go. Just stay, talk to her, hold her hand. And she said, and I'll come back from time to time and make sure you're OK. And she did that, and she, I stayed there for four hours until that lady died. And I'll never, ever forget Sister Lambert. I'll never forget how frightened of her I was either, but she was absolutely brilliant. And I never saw her not do the right thing by her staff and by the patients for whom we, she was responsible. So I'm going to finish with my favorite person. When my sister was dying at home, not of dementia, but she was a young woman with her kids, we sat and read Winnie the Pooh because that's what she said she wanted. And this is what we should always remember. So when we can't be together, keep me in your heart, because I shall be there forever. Thank you.